Welcome to a seat at the table where there is real talk on real situations from real people. This is your girl, Jaquel Jones, and I'm also your host. Let's get into it, y'all. Welcome, welcome to a seat at the table. I am your host, Jaquel Jones, and look at who I have with me today. We're going to say welcome back to the table, Calandra Coleman. And new to the table, we have Derek Riddick. That's D Riddick for y'all who really know him. Tora Bonner. I think Tori is on the low. He's like a whole Instagram, Facebook, social media. Like, he's an all-star for real. Uh, I ain't know it, but now I know it. And our younger at the table, say what's up to Devontae Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, y'all. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, today at the table, we're going to be discussing the crab mentality. Oh my gosh. Um, I think it is a one of those stigmas that Black people and the Black culture has had um, for many, many years. And um, we, in a conversation amongst um, some of my close friends, we were talking about this and someone gave like this epiphany to the fact. And I said, well, you know what? I think we got the topic for the next show. So um, I'm going to let um, my co-host um, give them just a little feedback about who they are and um, what they bring to the table. Um, Cece, we're going to bring you back, so we're going to start with you. Hello there, um, people out there. This is Kalandra Coleman, your Generation X in the building, 1977, coming with this uh, topic. I'm excited and nervous at the same time. <laughs> Don't be nervous. We got this. <laughs> All right, D-Ready, tell us about yourself. Hey, how y'all doing? Uh, Derek Riddick, born and raised in Portsmouth, Generation X as well. And uh, this topic is something, you know, everybody on the panel lets you know that this is what I'm passionate about and what drives me. So we're going to have a good conversation today. All right. All right, Tori, come on in. What's going on, everyone? I'm Tori Barner uh, from Portsmouth, Virginia as well. Uh, but I'm Generation Y. Wow. Bringing you know. everything together, you know, bringing everything together, X and Z <laughs> together, all right? I'm the one in the middle. But I uh, definitely want to talk about this topic and, you know, see where everybody has is. All right. And our youngin' at the table, come on, Mr. Duante. <laughs> all right. My name is Duante. Um, I'm Generation Z, I suppose. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a very interesting conversation because I have conversations like this with some of my family members. And kind of clash sometimes with certain ones, but some some understand. So it's really interesting to see different viewpoints. And, you know, thank you. And actually, our youngin has kind of brought everything into the the front as far as why we have these different generations on the call because we want to get the perspectives of everyone and from what their perspective is as far as what they've seen within our culture and as the times have changed. So just a little background on the generations: we have our baby boomers. Um, baby boomers are born between 1946 and 1964. So um, today they're going to be between the age of 57 and 75. And then we have our Generation X stand up, CC and D. Riddick. You guys were born between 1965 and 1979 and or 80. And you're currently between 41 and 56 years old. Sorry to tell it all. And then we have our Generation Y. Come on, Taurus, stand up. You barely made it, but you in there. Generation Y, we are the millennials. I am a Generation Y myself, born between 1981 and 1994 or through six. 1987, stand up if you're in the building. I'm just saying, we, we, we just in there like that. But we are currently between 25 and 40 years old. And then we have our Generation Z. Whew. These babies right here. They were born between 1997 and 2012 through 2015, currently between the ages of six and 24. So we have everybody at the table today and we're going to get right into it. So let, we're going to start off by talking about the Black experience. What has been your Black experience, whether it be in life, business, or in today's society? What have you been faced with just for being Black? We're going to talk about it. And I'm going to start with the young Come on, Wante. <laughs> um, well, I would say for me in, in the life aspect, um, I would say you would see stereotypes come into play because you would see like people be stereotyped a certain way and then you would see how they fall into that stereotype and how they actually cater to that stereotype as 
acting or being that stereotype or just even even certain things that they like do that you can see as being stereotypical um so it's very interesting because like I see that in my family a lot too as well because it's like a lot of things I see is like stereotypical and then when you say something about it everyone's like nah it's not like that or they try to like brush it off and try to make it seem like it's not that so it's really interesting like I really it's just because I mean stereotypes is really everything honestly to an extent in the um in the business I would say like getting a job and everything you can tell like certain people move up faster and than what you would because of your skin color and you know just like just certain things like for example like you might see like white people move up faster in rank than you would and if you do move up fast you have to like almost like break your neck to like do it and it's really interesting because it's like mm, why should that be the case you know what I mean like that's good stuff yeah so and I feel like in today's society it's a lot because like you go anywhere from like stereotypes and police brutality to like you know like the business side of things not being where exactly where we should be and like you know what I mean like economically it, it it's a lot so yeah well thank you for the feedback I, I definitely think I can see from the head and eyes that everybody sees you know at least can share your perspective on some of the things that you said so d really I know this is your passion so just tell me a little bit about what you have seen because I, I often refer to you as the the black encyclopedia <laughs> you know it all <laughs> so, so give us a little bit of your feedback <clears throat> um my my black experience, um, I think in a way, it, it's been kind of unique because I'm the type of person who um, I, I kind of see things from the outside viewpoint, so to speak. Um, so I came across, you know, like Wante says, some stereotypical things, you know, that you that people expect to happen within for black males and within black families and things like that. And my experience growing up was completely different. Um, I did have um, friends and family who, <clears throat> you know, were directly from the streets of Portsmouth and who did the things that some people in the streets of Portsmouth do. Um, but because, you know, of my, my dad and my mother and my extended family, um, I was kind of protected. It's all the things that went on, you know, understood the streets and all of those things you know, even maneuver with those people within that setting. But I always had it in the back of my mind that um, this is not what it has to be. And seeing that, um, just like he said, you know, you, you see it, you know it's there. You don't necessarily want to call it out in a sense because that is family and friends and things, but you do want to make them aware that it doesn't have to be this way. You know, so um, from that perspective, you know, compared to some of what my friends had gone through, even some members of my family, um, it's almost like sometimes um, even your own family and friends, people within the Black community sometimes want to try to pigeonhole you to a certain status or, you know, to a certain level of functioning or whatever. And uh, what I've learned over time is... Um, to let those people go. And that that's not the majority, you know? And I think historically, uh, we've always been shown what the minority of the black community does as far as numbers, you know, people who are in trouble, people who are going to jail. So I think historically, that's had a direct effect on how we see ourselves. So I was always taught to look at things from a different perspective, from that majority perspective that we don't often get to see in the media, TV, movies and things like that. So my perspective growing up was a whole lot different than some of the people that I was around. All right, d Reddy, we want to thank you for that feedback. And I sincerely, when I say I'm from Portsmouth myself, and it has definitely been one of those things of being of the city, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily having to stay down with the city. And I think we have, um, we want to teach those things to our younger generations all the time, but 
you know, sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a shift that has to happen in the mindset. And we're going to get into that um, as we go on. So I want to yield the floor to Tori so he can give us a little bit of his feedback on the Black experience. My Black experience, uh, I would have to say just like everyone else, like being from Portsmouth, you don't necessarily have to be one of the people that you see from Portsmouth. And when I what I say about that is everyone sees the the people that are out there doing what they're not supposed to, you know, something illegal or fast money, trying to get to it. But no one ever sees the people that are actually that make Portsmouth. Like uh Derek said, you know, the majority of the people that live in Portsmouth. Majority of the people that live in Portsmouth are retired folks or or people that are, you know, business women, businessmen, um, people that are actually prestigious. We there's so many different people that come from from Portsmouth, so many different athletes, um, politicians, and to even military. Um, is this is this so crazy that you can be from one place? That's so small and so loving and, and no, everyone knows everyone, but we never really speak about all the different accomplishments that, that go on. And like my experiences, you know, I have to thank my mother for it because um, I'm the youngest of three, three boys. So my mom made sure that we had that experience of, of seeing different things or being in different places at different times or being in different programs. Because I, I feel like I wouldn't be where I am today if I just kept focusing on what was in front of me, in a sense. So the different programs, like um, being in after-school programs or being in college programs where I'm, I'm spending the week or three weeks at, for the summer at a college where I'm taking classes and stuff, that stuff right there you know it kind of helped shape me who I am but I definitely have to agree with Derek on that we we never talk about the majority we always talking about the minority awesome stuff right there awesome stuff now I know um Portsmouth is definitely representing in the building right now but CC. <laughs> I don't know I feel like we need to adopt you in but you got to go through a process but CC is not necessarily from Portsmouth but she has, and when I say, I learned so many things from CC on a daily basis. Um, even just last night, she started kicking some stuff to me, and I'm like, you know who? <laughs> so, <laughs> so she's a little wealth of knowledge herself. So, CC, tell us a little bit about your black experience. Well, let me just say this. Um, I said before, y'all shouting out Portsmouth. I ain't even rep my city. Bad news in the building. You know, parts of the little baby bad news. Okay, but no, no. So, in listening to you guys, I think about um, years ago, um, I started teaching in Richmond City, in the inner city. Um, in the hood, we serviced uh, five housing projects where I worked. And I remember my principal, and we adopted this demography does not determine your destiny. And we all on this um, on this call, we may not have been brought up in the best of places. I'm from downtown Newport News, it's the, the uh, number streets. Um, but that didn't determine where I was going to go. Now, granted, I, I saw a lot. I have an older brother. I'm the middle. I'm the middle child, but I don't have that middle child mentality. But I think because I'm the girl in the middle of two boys. Um, but I did see a lot. But um, in seeing that and being exposed, like Tori said, I was in Upward Bound um, during the summer. I went on college tours. It was just in me to say, I'm not going to be a product of my environment. I'm not going to be the statistic, um, not to say that um, teenage mothers can't be successful, but I wanted to make sure that I was not um, that statistic. I had little um, cousins that looked up to me. I have one that um, is following this podcast now. I'm sure she's going to shout it out. I was her role model. I didn't know that, 
but I was making choices for myself that helped shape some of the some of my, my youth. So it's just this this uh, conversation is just rich, and I'm glad to be a part of it. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> I think we all are, and I think it's one of those conversations that you um, that you have, like I say, at the kitchen table all the time. You know, when you have your family over, the uncles, and you know your cousins and your aunties, and you sit and talk about these things and how you, you know, how, where you come from and how things are now, and how you hope that things will be in the future for those generations that are coming under us. So, uh, when it comes to those things, what do y'all feel like other cultures don't, just don't understand about Black culture? What, what is like that one thing that they just don't get? All right, there we're gonna start with you. Mm. Um, I don't think they understand that, you know, black culture rules everything. You know, without black culture, you wouldn't have certain things. Things wouldn't, certain things wouldn't be the way that they are. And <clears throat> I think they look at black culture as a novelty. Um, but I don't think the understanding or the deeper understanding of black culture is there for other races. Um, they look at what they see on television, they look at what they see in movies, but they don't understand that, <clears throat> you know, without black culture, um, you wouldn't have certain movements that occurred in history. You wouldn't have jazz music. You wouldn't have um, that whole Renaissance um, era. Um, <clears throat> you wouldn't have hip hop, you know, which is a, a global, almost universal phenomenon that comes out of black culture. Um, so I think to me, they the problem is that they look at black culture as just this novelty and don't have a true understanding of what a black culture truly is and what is truly given, and particularly in America, you know, um, it's like, oh yeah, that's black, okay, great. But no, it's a little bit deeper than that. You know, the black culture is rooted in <clears throat> Not necessarily, I don't say survival anymore. I say black culture is rooted in overstanding and overcoming. Um, and, and like Bruce Lee said, you know, you have to be like water. And that's what black people in America have done for centuries. You know, we've been like water, whatever's been thrown at us, we've adapted, made those changes and turned it into something that you would never know even existed. That's awesome right there. Awesome, awesome. All right, Wante, just something they don't understand about our culture. What would it be? Oh, I kind of agree with the whole, like, they don't understand, like, a lot of things come from it. And, like, with that being said, like, if you don't understand where something comes from, you can't really, like, when other people do take from it, it's like, they choose what they pick, and they don't really have a true meaning behind it. So, like, that self it creates a struggle for the culture because it's like you're taking things and you're flipping it or you're using it however you want to use it but you it's at the same time you're taking it it's not like you're actually giving that credit to the culture more say you're just like oh we like you know what i mean like it's like a sample like if you sample a record and you take like the main thing from it it's more say okay you took you sample you heard the sample but you're not giving credit to the sample you're giving credit to your song in general so I feel like they just don't understand the struggle and certain things that Black people have to deal with in general. And it's a lot of things that goes into the culture because not the culture is just not just about struggling, but it's about empowerment and like like fighting for what you want and to exceed what, what the odds that are given to you. So I feel like they just don't understand the struggle and they don't understand where, where, like, where we actually play a part in. Like, you see, when you like, when you go to the store, you see a product, you don't under, but most people don't think of where that product had to go to get to that point. So I'll say that. Okay, okay. Tori? I would say, kind of coming from a different viewpoint, is what they believe Black culture is, rather than what the full view of Black culture People believe that black culture is drug, you know, being drug dealers, using drugs, being rappers, athletes. Like that's black culture to some people's eyes. Being the the video vixen in, in a video, like that is black culture in some people's eyes. 
And like, you know, like was already said, like struggle. But, you know, we, we've all kind of agreed upon that that isn't what black culture is. It's perseverance. It's, you know, I think Derek hit it right on the head. Like we literally, you know, <clears throat> black culture is like, it's the amino acids of life, low key. Like, of what's going on? The building block, seriously. Like when when I mean when I say perseverance, like you know, I I hold this story kind of like dear to my heart. Like, um, when I was in high school and college, I wrote a paper on Colonel Charles Young, and he actually <clears throat> was a black colonel, the first black colonel in the United States Army. And they kicked him out because he had high blood pressure. They kicked him out because he had high blood pressure and he couldn't. And so he basically had to show them that he could be there. So many people say that he ride on, he rode on a horse. Some people said he walked, but he traveled 500 miles from Wilberforce, Ohio to Washington, D.C. to say, hey, I am fit for duty. It was it was a simple fact of Tim saying, look, I, like, nah, you can't tell me no. And then when you get there, you know, they tell him, hey, we're going to send you to Africa. And he's like, look, you send me to Africa, I'm going to die. And he already knew it. But he's like, you know what, I'm going to go anyway. It was, a, it was the fact of, you know what, I'm here to fight. Like, I'm going to fight regardless. You're not going to tell me no. That is black culture. And everything that we do, we always fight. We always persevere through through the ups, through the downs. We always have. And, you know, it's just, it's just amazing how you can see just from different viewpoints of how, how one thing or what one person may do can change the view of others. That's, that is an awesome story. Awesome story. And I think... And not to even shift gears too much, but that's when we get into white privilege. Um, when you think about the path that you have to walk, you know, white privilege, your path is straight. When it comes to a black person walking that same as that path, they have curves and turns and obstacles to jump over, to leap over. And so those are the things that kind of, they kind of are, are barriers to get into that same point that our counterparts have to get to in culture. So I think um, a lot of what you guys have said was awesome. Um, I think for myself, if I had to say something that was, um, that they just didn't get is that we are a loving race and um, loving and forgiving, to be honest. Um, I heard uh, Farrakhan say one time that when in an interview that he was doing um, that white people should understand that your mindset of what you think Black people's mindset is, that's what has the hate that comes from your actions and your thoughts and your words and your intention when it's just that thought because you are so caught up in what your people did to us that you think we are always in a retaliatory mindset. And that's just not the case when it comes to Black people. We just want a fair chance to do the same things that you're doing. In the, same, in the same country that you live in, we want that same fairness and equality that you have. We want our path to be straight too. So I, I think um, when it comes down to that black experience for us, we're just a loving race. We, we, we come with the soul. I keep saying, I think that's my new thing. Don't talk about me, um, Z generation anyway. But we ain't come for the smoke. We, we just want to live and we want to live well. And we want our same opportunities to get the wealth and prosperity as any other culture and any other race. All right. So we're ready to shift it into the meat of the discussion, the crab mentality. If I can't have it, you can't have it. Now, we have talked so much about the good qualities and all the good things about our culture, but let's keep it a honey. There are people in our culture, there are there is a, a mindset that has still not completely shifted when it comes down to making it out. And when I say making it out, we're going to put it into context, getting out of the barrel. We crabs in a barrel. We're trying to get out. You have some people who understand, hey, when you win, I win. And then you have others who are like, well, I ain't getting out. I'm going to make it hard for you to get out. 
why do we still have that mindset? So when you think about the crap mentality, Cece, tell me what are your initial thoughts? So being this uh, Generation X person, my initial thought of crabs in a barrel is a negative connotation. Um, I think that, like you said, um, if if you're trying to make it, I'm trying to pull you down, even though you're trying to pull me up with you. I feel like it's a negative connotation. Um, I looked at it in a negative way until I why I spoke up, Mr. Sorry Bonner. Um, he made he made an analogy about the crabs. And now it's like, hmm, are we really trying to pull each other down? Do we really know what those crabs are actually doing? Are they latching onto each other to pull the one that's getting out down? Or is the one that's being pulled out pulling the one that's still in the barrel up? So my, 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 this conversation and, and my wheels have been turning ever since we had that conversation via Zoom with Mr. Y. Um, so I'm a little conflicted because we do, like um, Ms. Jones, J Jay said, we do have those people in our culture that if you're doing well, you think you're better than me or whatever. And it's not necessarily that way. I'm just trying, I'm trying to make it just like you are. And I just happen to take a path that got me there maybe a little faster, but I'm coming back to get you, sis. I, I, I'm not that negative person. Like I Absolutely. want us all to win and it's enough out here for all of us to win. Right. Okay. And I, I saw his head moving. So I think he might have something to say. Um, come on, youngin. What you got to say? about the crap mentality. What are your initial thoughts? Um, I, it was, I mean, like you said, it's certain people in the culture where you do try to excel at things. And just because it's not, like for me being young, like a, I have a lot of older people in my family or just a, around me in general, dealing with people. And like, it's like certain goals or aspirations that I have, they might like put it down because it's not, the opportunity that they had or is not what they would ideally do so like they'll just say things like I don't think you should do that or that's not a good idea or that just put the like they won't even have the conversation like because yeah like I'm young I mean sometimes I need advice and I need people to talk to about like what I feel would be best for me or in general but like if I'm always getting like the negative like the negative size and never like the good like at that point, then it kind of pulls me down because I don't know, like, because I don't know everything. So if I'm just getting negative, that's going to want me to just stay to that, that mentality. Like they said, like the minority thing, like it's going to make me want to do things like sell drugs and stuff because I'm not used to having, I don't, I'm not used to that other side or having people that have had that other side. So I don't really know what's on the other side. And just hearing the negative things when I do want to go on the other side makes you want to stay because it's like, okay, at that point, like, okay, if I'm not going to get that here and I can do it here, like, at that point, like, you might as well just stay where you're at. Like, there's there's no point of trying to do anything else if that's what you're used to. So I would say, like, on that point, like, it's pulling you down, but uh, at the same time, the holding on thing, I do, I do agree with, like, they might be trying to hold on because they might see something in you that you don't see, and they could be trying to attach you or have your energy around them so that they can't so that they can better themselves but at the same time sometimes you have to learn how to let go and let that person succeed so that way like you said they can come back for example like Harriet Tubman like she went a lot of people were trying to run away being during slavery and she did it and like at first she did it by herself so she knew that she could succeed and then she went back and took other people with her so in a sense is like everyone was telling her not to do it of course because they're like you know this could happen like she was hearing the negative but she didn't let that define who she was or who she wanted to be so she still she still excelled and then she came back and helped so yeah that's awesome and thank you for, for bringing in uh -huh, bringing in that that pool from my history and and just so we know Harriet Tubman was one of many one of many and I, I think one of the things that we really and that's why I love when Derek speaks because he, he talks about those hidden facts and those people that you don't hear too much about when it comes down to our history and um, those who actually 
you know, they made the mark. You don't hear their name much, but they definitely made the mark in um, creating those opportunities for us to get to better. So um, with that being said, Derek, tell me, how do you deal with someone that you feel is that negative crab in the barrel? Um, well, let me say this first. I think that, that that mentality is about vision and security. And when I say that, I mean, if you don't have that vision, to be able to see into the future or see something better, the vision that you can do something different. Um, you stay secure, like Devante said, in that place you're in. And I think that is what a lot, a lot of times what happens is because, like I said earlier, we're bombarded so much about with, with the negatives and the failures and this, put this stereotype of what you should be. And when people don't have a vision of something broader and something bigger, then they can only see what they've been given. And if you haven't been given that, like Devante said as well, if you haven't been given, you know, that vision from someone who's been there, you don't know it's there. So for me, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think it's a, a double-edged sword for me because I try to always see the good in people. And because I have such a high tolerance for quote unquote pain in a sense, I always give people more chances than not. And so even if I know it's someone who is not listening to the things that I'm trying to, you know, give them or the jewels I'm trying to drop on them, I'm gonna just drop it anyway. And a lot of times that's just for me to be able to say, you know what? I tried to help this brother out. I tried to get his sister something. And hopefully one day they'll take it. But it, it gets to a point also where, you know, you have to save your energy and you have to conserve your mentality. And it gets to a point where you have to make a decision of how much you're going to give to a person. Mm -hmm. And at what level do you just say you're not getting it? Me personally, I'm the type, even if you ain't getting it today, you come back in a year or two and you say, you know what I see now? great, let's go ahead and put in this work and let's get moving. So for me, that's, you know, how I kind of deal with it. Um, it can be draining, it can be exhausting, but, um, you know, I think just transforming why you do it, not necessarily for that person, but to say to yourself, you know what, this is what I attempted to do. So I can sleep easy saying that I tried to help someone improve themselves or their situation. Absolutely. And I want to go to um, our Facebook group, um, A Seat at the Table. Michelle said, we do not always know or have the know-how to escape or move beyond our current circumstances. And I think that kind of summed up what you and Dewante have said um, in regards to the mindset of the quote-unquote negative crap. So thank you guys again for that feedback. I think um, we heard some, some awesome, awesome things um, as it deals with like directly on the mindset of our culture and our and black people as it relates to being the crab in the barrel. Now, Tori, this um this whole episode was really inspired by something that you said. So I want to give you that space to kind of share um that wisdom because that's exactly what it was a little bit of wisdom um with the, the audience uh, as it relates to shifting the mindset of the crabs in the barrels. That was one of my grandmother's favorite saying was just a crab in a barrel they, that's all they are they're just crab in a barrel that's all she used right. to say and uh it used to down on me because my mom used to always say you know just always try to think of the positive think of the positive think of the positive so when you look at the game um monkeys in a barrel the the thing for it to that game is you take one monkey and you make a chain link as many as you can. The most people, the more, the more monks you have on your chain link, you're the winner. So it dawned on me. It was like, well, what about crabs in the barrel? Right, getting back into the swing of the podcast, we just want to send a prayer up for um, our baby boy. Tori had to um, go off because he had a family emergency. But um, I do want to just give highlights to the um the shift in the culture that he was um, about to explain to us um, on that call that he was discussing. He was talking about how um, the crabs in the barrel were not always um, trying to 
pull the other down, but versus trying to grab a hole to be pulled up to. Um, and when we think about that, and I think the conversations that we've had um, thus far has kind of given highlights of that in itself. So in shifting the mindset, um, just thinking about it in a different way will, I think, allow us to change our actions and our thoughts as it pertains to the crabs in the burrow. If we could, once we have a way and we've learned a new way, or we've been, like Derek said, being our natural selves, being resource, no, I think Cece said, being resourceful people in everything that we do, we show the next person, we show the next circle, we show the next crowd so that it, it, it kind of transitions from that minority being the highlight to the majority being the highlight. And so with that said, um, we want to talk about some of the ways that we can shift the mindset of Black people. Now, I can say for myself in, um, in my uh, career field and um, some of the things that I encounter when it comes down to Black families and even within my own family, um, one of the major things that we have to do, stop making excuses. We have to stop making excuses. It cannot be their fault, his fault, my mama fault, my daddy fault. When do we get past that place of hurt, pain, and, and we trying to shift the, the, the um, terminology from that survival move to being resourceful? When do you stop pulling and, and trying to like grab a hold of all the things that were negative and start really thinking about what you have and what you can do to bring more positive into your space, into your life, into your circumstances? Is it the people that you still roll with? Is it, is it the conversations that you still have? The, the things that you talk about every time you pick up the phone every day, the applications you keep putting in for the same benefits, like change your tone, change your mindset. You have to shift that thing. Because if you don't, you're going to be stuck in the same routine, the same patterns that you have been doing for decades. Decades. We've been doing the same thing. When does it shift? Case in point, this darn stimulus money. Now, we've seen in the news where we have like a whole family gone that had a freaking stimulus check. The money is going to come and it's going to go. I have seen so many Beamers being driven around, so many Mercedes, that 1995, 2000 Mercedes, bruh, is not going to be gone. I mean, the car going to be gone in two years. You bought an 05 Beamer with your money. I'm just saying, I got to keep it aside. I got to keep it. Let me tell you something. My 2013 Ford, she's been pushing for a few years now. I got her off the lot, off my check, my regular check. You get what I'm saying? Like, you have to think smarter. What did you invest that money in? How much did you put up for your kids? Like, those are the things, the conversations that I feel like we got to start having as a Black people in order to get us to the next level. What did you invest in yourself, in your vision, in your goals? Like, what did we do? What are we going to do? I told you I had a lot to say on that part, so I'm going to come on down off my stoop because I feel like I'm just... I'm here, you know, I'm passionate about my people and I want to, I want to see us do better. I want us to, I want to see us have a different conversation when we come to the table. It can't just be about the negative and the naysayers and what, the, what you would have done different, but bruh, sis, you ain't do it. Why are you talking about what she did or what he did when you didn't do it? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I got to chime in on that. <laughs> chime on, I, chime on. You, you have really brought a lot of things to the forefront. Like what you said, we have to change our thinking. Um, and we can't start. We can't keep talking about it. We got to be about it. And when you have those negative people, I, I don't know how many times I looked on social media this during this whole year that we've been in this pandemic. And you have our people saying, I can't let you disturb my peace. And even if you are a family member, if you will be that negative Nancy, I'm going to love you from afar. I still love you, but I can't let you bring that into this positive mindset that I have right here. I'm trying to do some things. And like sis said, the stimulus check, I just cannot believe that you killed somebody because you wanted $700. Like, Bro, where where was your thinking? What 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 are you doing to make your own money? Also, we when you have those negative people, if you just feel that 
I think um, Dewante said that maybe they are around you because you are that positivity. When that person is just being so negative, go ahead and shift that thing. Throw some of that positivity in there because that's what they need. They need to see that we can't keep on laying it on such and such did this, these generational curses. We had this acknowledge it was a generational curse, but it has to stop somewhere. And you yes. have to come up and say, it stops with me. Like, I'm not going to keep on doing this. I'm not going to be this, this guinea pig, this on, on hamster wheel. It has to stop somewhere. We can't keep saying, well, it, it was like this. It was like that. Come on. Come on. Say, I see you. Come on. No, because y'all are saying some very interesting things like, for example, with the stimulus money and stuff like pri like priorities, like a lot of people, I feel like a lot of Black people in the culture more say they focus on temporary and they focus on how things look versus how they really are. So with that, like you're going to buy a car and then not thinking what the car comes maintenance and all that. If you get this one-time payment and you don't have a job or you don't have this and you don't have that, then your car is going to break down and then you're going to get mad and then you're going to blame everybody else for why you don't, why your car is down. Like, you're going to be like, oh, I don't have the money for it when you can go out and you can get the means to get your car fixed or some and stuff like that. Or even then, like, don't get something that's flashy and you know the maintenance is going to be high because at that point, maintenance is still going to be an issue. So is insurance. So it just depends. And then like the whole making excuses thing, like I, I agree. Cause like, I know sometimes myself, I do make excuses on why I didn't do anything or I didn't do certain things, but I'm a procrastinator, but like at the same time, yeah. <laughs> I, and I agree. I know I'm a procrastinator, but like, Guilty. yeah, <laughs> right. So like, I feel like I procrastinate, but to an extent, I'm just like, if I procrastinate, I, I take that responsibility. I don't just blame and be like, oh, I was waiting on this person to do it. Or it's because this and you give all these excuses. I just own up to it and be like, I ain't do it because I waited to the last minute and I thought I was going to do it, but it ain't work out that way. So it's just a, like, it's accountability. And like, I feel like a lot of people don't have that personal accountability and because they always either had someone to blame or they just don't want to take that personal responsibility. They're like, hey, it's my bad. Like, I, granted, it, it does take a lot for a person to say that they're wrong. And I get that. But like, at the same time, you blaming everyone else besides yourself for something that you caused is not it. it. It's really not like it's not. And then like far as like generational curses, like every, it does take a person. Sometimes you do say it, it stops here. And then at the end of the day, you do have those people that's like, well, you say that now and it's going to happen like that negative. And then it's like, yeah, but it does take a strong person to be like, no, I don't care what you say is going to happen, but I know I'm going to like it ends now. Like for me, like a lot of things in my family and stuff, like people say stuff and I'm like, I don't care what happened then or what this person got going on and what position they're in, but I want to be different. Like, I don't care. Like, like, like college and stuff, like, sometimes, like, yeah, I'd be thinking about getting a doctor's degree, don't know, but a lot of people, like, that's a waste of, uh, that's a waste of time, like, what you getting your doctor's for, it is, like, just because you didn't do it, and you maybe got just your bachelor's, doesn't mean I don't want to further myself and further my education to get a doctor's, or do something in that field, and do better, like, it's, just, like, I'm it. not gonna, yeah, like, because <laughs> it's, like, you don't want to cater, and it goes back to those stereotypes, like, with the stereotypes like black people are this black people are that and then it becomes a generational thing because we make it a generational thing and it always just takes that one person like it stops here but you're gonna get a lot of like you get a lot of backlash from it but at the same time it just takes like you just gotta know you gotta be focused I would say so. awesome. 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 awesome and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna leave this here and we can um, move on when we say it stops here we have to put some action behind it because you know that you have those negatives in your family, in your circle of friends. They're there, but you have to put some action behind it. And then when they see you do it, that can help shift. Oh, he really did get his master's degree. 
So, you know, the next generation, they can go ahead and get that doctorate degree. It, it takes one person to go ahead and start putting some of those, those words to action so that you can be from the show me state and not just the um, say, saying it and not doing it. Okay, show me state. You, you better be from there. Walk it. No, just talk it. Well, ain't it a song? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway. Show my age. Don't worry about that. Okay, Derek. <laughs> Your turn to chime in. What do you want to see happen within Black community, and all communities, and how do you feel we can reach that? Um, I just, I just want to see, you know, progress, economic progress, social progress, mental progress, um, and that doesn't mean that, you know. Everybody in the black community has to live in a six hundred thousand dollar house. You know, um, I think just continuing that push, just continuing um, to develop black children. You know, just continuing to ensure that knowledge is passed on. Um, and I, I, I think the way to do that, um, I think, is happening. Um, and I think we had a conversation before, and I think I, I had mentioned that, you know, with everything that had gone on um, socially right now in the United States, that what came out of it from my perspective and what I try to see, like I said before, I always try to see the positive in something. Um, I think, you know, we, we're hitting the apex of a cultural shift in the Black community because, you know, we have so many people now who are promoting so many different positive things. Um, it's more black, you know, we talk about the stock market all the time. And probably 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't, we, I wouldn't be having this conversation on that level. So, you know, there's a cat who's called, he calls himself the Wall Street Trapper on Instagram, who's giving out, you know, this knowledge and things like that. Um, you know, the social circumstances are being addressed. Uh, we're even pulling those who um, are, are not people of color and are starting to see what we've been talking about and what we've been telling the world for years and years. So I just think what, what we have to do is collectively make our own choices. And by, what I mean by that is we can't let anyone else dictate or decide um, what our programming is, so to speak, what we see, you know, what we hear, what we listen to. Um, for example, you know, all of these um, companies after the George Floyd situation and um, uprisings that happened, you know, after that occurred, a lot of companies started having black people in their commercials. Okay, that's cool, that's fine. But how many black people do you have in your company? So I think you know, questioning those things and let making, um, you know, dictating now what we want, you know, because we have that authority, we have that power. And I think that, you know, the one thing I love about Duante's generation is that they're taking hold of what is happening in the world. So they can utilize that technology. They can utilize how to gather information and, and use that information. And I think what has to happen is information has to be put out because I don't care how rich you are, I don't care how much money you have, if you don't have the proper information, it means absolutely nothing. So I think that's the, a big part of it, is dictating our own programming and dictating the information that we use uh, to determine what that programming is. Thank you for that, Derry. And those are the, those little drops of knowledge that you, you do all the time when it comes to just, you know, having that shift and the movement of our people in, in general, the, the different conversations um, that I was talking about earlier, when we, why don't we have black investment circles that we actually know about? You know what I'm saying? Those types of things, that's how we're gonna end, the, end up shifting our culture and actually understanding, not just seeing it on the news and you know seeing the different people that are coming across the TV, but knowing the actual, you know, the, the ins and outs of politics and how it works and how it affects you as a business owner or how it can affect you becoming a business owner, things of that nature. So I really feel like this has been a power-packed conversation. 
I want to give um, way to um, our Black Corner where we highlight some Black business owners. Um, I'm going to start tonight and I'm going to um, give highlight to, I think, two. Um, we went to school together. Um, his name is Mel. Um, on, you can find him on Instagram. It's um, Striving for Greatness Lifestyle. Mel is an awesome, awesome, awesome trainer. When I say I'm scared, like, because I'm going to tell you, you're going to see results. And I reached out to him a while ago. Mind you, no, no follow through. Another thing that we got to stop doing in our culture. Don't, don't, don't come for me to help. And then you don't have no follow through, man. You can talk about me later. But he has a program. When I say you're going to see results and just um, the wellness factors of it, when in the conversation that I did have with him, he's all about shifting your lifestyle shifting everything that as it results in your wellness. So look, if you're looking for a personal trainer or someone to kind of help you how to quote your wellness, reach out to me on Instagram, striving for greatness. I think it's striving underscore the number four, um, for underscore greatness, a lifestyle. So find him on Instagram. Um, he's an awesome, awesome trainer. And I'll give away to you guys. Um, again, this is our Black Highlight, giving way to um, Black business owners. I have to um, be well. Um, she is, uh, she does um, the sea moss, the infused sea moss, and things of that nature. Her Instagram is b.e.w.e.l.l03. That's be well on Instagram. So she has a lot of um, natural teas um, and things of that nature. I use her um sea moss to help lower this A1C, okay? I'm just going to have to be a little more consistent with it, as well as um, my classmate, uh, Sweet Treats by Tamika. If you're looking for custom cakes, Sweet Treats underscore by Tamika on Instagram, look her up. She makes good good stuff, good stuff there. All right. Thank you, Cece. Um, Dewante, did you have anybody that you wanted to name? Yep. Uh, Mommy Loves Naturals on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, she does like bracelets, uh, sprays, and all that good stuff. Well, thank you for the highlight. Mama Loves Naturals, Instagram and Facebook. Meeting all your natural hair and skincare needs. All right. Derek, what about you? You got anybody you want to highlight? Yeah, uh, right out of Portsmouth um, Clothing Company, Code 757. Um, you can find them, I believe, on Instagram. I know you can find them on Facebook. But it does uh, absolutely great stuff. So check them out. All right, you heard it here first. Go check out those Black business owners and make sure you support, support, support. We have to support our own. I want to thank a special, special thank you for this conversation, Calandra Coleman, Derek Riddick, Duwante Wallace, and my dear friend, Tora Barnum, who had to leave out a little early, um, sending blessings to your family at this time. And again, I thank you guys for having a seat at the table and having these difficult conversations to shift our Black culture and our communities. Thank y'all, and I hope you enjoy. Come back next week for a seat at the table.